Salutations, everyone. Welcome back to another Total Warhammer 3 guide. I'm Lord Formand, and today we are covering the Lizardmen. This guide is going to be divided by chapters, so you can click below um, to skip to what you need. We're going to quick cover the faction, what makes it unique, and we'll go over its units, its economy, its technology, and finally, we will go over the various lords and starting situations, which in the case of the Lizardmen are rather complex. So, the Lizardmen are a very interesting faction that, uh, by and large, plays very differently than uh, a lot of the other factions in the game. The greatest similarities they probably have is to the Vampire Counts, which is kind of interesting because they're nothing like them at all. So, the Lizardmen, of course, are a race of man-sized, man-like lizards. Yeah, kind of cool. Um... They're, they focus heavily on um, reinforcing what they call the Great Plan, um, which is basically to prevent the world from falling into chaos and vampiric stuff, as far as I understand it. They're all about order and untainted, untaintedness everywhere. Um, they are a kind of a do-what-you-want faction, similar to the Empire. You can kind of play them however you like. They're but on defensive, actually they're really good on defensive depending on uh, which Lizardman Lord you have. And they're also pretty good on the offensive. Their one weakness is, of course, range units, which we'll talk about later. They only... There is a couple Lords with unique mechanics, but in general the Lizardmen have mainly just one mechanic, making them, by and large, one of the easiest factions for beginners or new players to learn. They have what they call... The geometric web, geomantic web. And if you own a full province, you can of course do edicts, right? The geometric, geomantic web, as you have more settlements nearby. So, like if I own this one and I own this one and I own this one, all nearby, it will strengthen the web here, which will improve the edict. And then, as you can see, it goes up. Now, you have to then, at some point, at level 3, you have to build Geomantic Pylons, Spires, and Locusts to boost it fully. But it will improve your Edicts um, considerably. And here it will tell you exactly what it does over here. And uh, that's a very interesting but very simple mechanic. I wouldn't expand just to reinforce your web. The benefits are not so unbelievably amazing. Uh, but it's a cool little mechanic you want to keep an eye on as you go forth. The Lizardmen, because they're a base total Warhammer 2 faction, also have access to rights. And the rights change based off the Lord. But roughly, you have a Rite of Awakening, which will get you a Slam Mage Priest, a very powerful spellcaster the Lizardmen have. You tend to have a right that gives you a bonus to recruit rank, money, recruitment capacity. And then you all, they almost all of them, have a Rite of Primeval glory where you can for a massive amount of money and a effect duration 15 turns in a huge 50 turn cooldown you can spawn an army filled with the most powerful dinosaurs basically you can get at your capital and you can use it to go on a rampage or if you're being invaded it can be a very uh, last ditch defensive effort to break an invasion um, especially with the new end game scenarios this could be a very powerful technique um, uh, in this case, Tic Tac Toe, who we're looking at right now, has his own unique right. When he uses it, it increases the movement range, but we'll go over um, It's actually that simple. Basically, it increases the movement range, but once they move a certain distance, they can't move out. They can't leave the march. Um, allows him to shoot around the map. Other Lizardmen have other edicts. If I remember, I will talk about them in the Starting Lord sections. That's Tic Tac Toe's. So, another thing to remember as the Lizardmen, you are a defender of order and untaintedness. So, by and large, you're only going to get along with factions that are untainted. So, High Elves, men, sometimes the Tomb Kings, depending on how you play, um, and other Lizardmen. Outside of that, you're not going to get along with Skaven. You're not going to get along with Dark... Well, you could get along with Dark Elves, but I find you tend not to. Um... They, you'll probably get along with half decently well. Um, 
dwarves as well. You're not going to get along with vampires, um, either coast or counts. You're not going to get along with warriors of chaos at the various demons. Your whole thing is honestly to wipe those guys off the face of the planet. And, uh, just that kind of gives you an idea of who you should be fighting. Um, try not to fight the other order factions if you can help it, but, uh, but again, they make good eating for lizard men. Oh, I should mention the one exception to men being not the worst enemy is Marcus Wolfhart, uh, who starts in Lystria, and to some degree the Bretonian, um, the new era, the new start of one of the Bretonian lords in Lystria. They're both kind of anti-lizardmen factions. Okay, let's talk buildings. So you'll notice I'm two turns into a game here. This is so I can show you the difference between a large settlement and a minor settlement. And uh, actually, we're going to cover units from the buildings as part of the buildings in general. So a minor settlement has a couple different buildings that you cannot build in a major settlement. So I'll quickly run over those. In a major settlement, you can build a weapons crafter commune that you cannot build in a minor settlement. Um, this allows to recruit some Horned Ones, Temple Guards, and Sacred Crocs Guard. You have to build other buildings, but this is the final unlocking. It also unlocks the technology. You can also only build Star Chambers in major capital settlements. You can't build them in a minor settlement. You can, however, build a Scrying Pool in a minor settlement, which is quite interesting. And then the final one is way over here on the right. In a major settlement, you can reinforce the geomantic web. As I said, um, you need these to get the highest level. But in a minor settlement, that's replaced by stone markers, which unlock te a technology, but then also improve income and recruitment capacity in the province. Um, this allows the lizardmen to have pretty good economy. So um, on to the actual units here. So the Lizardmen units come in four categories to some degree. You've got your Skinks, which are your kind of low-level skirmisher cheap units. They're not bad. They're just not as good as your other units. And outside of the one faction that kind of has to use Skinks a lot, I don't tend to use Skinks much beyond the first handful of turns. So you have uh, Skink Skirmishers, which are... Kind of one of your only range units. Lizardmen lack good archers and stuff. Um, so these guys do poison. They can fire while moving, which makes them fairly effective. And they can run away. So they are a skirmisher, just like the name implies. Uh, they're pretty useful. Um, bring one or two of them, I'd say, to a battle. They're uh, better than nothing. Um, actually, I should talk about these guys over here. So here's some of the other basic skinks that you get at level 1. Um, skink Cohorts are a basic Skink Melee Cudgel unit, which is quite interesting. Not quite a club unit. Um, they're not great. They will kind of hold their own against low-level infantry like Skaven and stuff, but don't expect to fight anyone like a Dwarf unit. Um, they will die. And they will die quickly. The other one they have is another Skink Cohort, kind of like the Skirmisher. These ones use Javelins. And I, I really wanted to talk about the difference between this unit with javelins and this one with skirmishers. The skirmishers basically use poison dart guns, which is really cool. The skirmishers throw javelins, but if you look up at ammunition, they only have three ammunition. So after they throw the three ammunition, they basically become a melee unit. And they're not that good at melee. They're better than the skink skirmishers. I would actively avoid building skink cohorts if you have the option to build skink skirmishers. Otherwise, I, I, they're not that amazing. No. The next one is Great Red Crested Skinks, uh, an armor piercing unit, which can be quite useful early on if you're fighting an enemy with armor. If you were to fight the dwarves, you'd want to bring this over the other skink units that you get early on. Uh, in general, uh, they're damage dealer that if you can flank with, they still do decent damage up to the mid-game, but you have better units. The next one up, you get a Skink Chief. Uh, skink Chiefs are kind of like, like they resemble the Wood Elf uh, unit as well. They're skirmishers from range. Um, they're not particularly great at melee. They're a hero unit, so they're not bad at it. Um, they do replenish troops, though, which makes it worthwhile to have one in every army for an additional replenishment, so you spend less time waiting. 
Um, and they also can assassinate other enemy heroes, which is quite nice. Especially because you can get them pretty early on. The only problem is you have to build a skink skirmisher building. And keep upgrading it to get it. Um, the next one is a chameleon skink. Which is pretty much just a flat upgrade to the skink skirmishers. Does more damage. Um, more importantly, it has camouflage. Uh, it is a chameleon here. So it can move hidden in any terrain. And is hard to hit with range. Basically, it's a flanking skirmisher unit. Um, again, the range units of the Lizardmen are not amazing. But uh, this one's half decent. Um, so if you once you upgrade, replace them. They are more expensive, though. They're 63 more gold a turn. Uh, I find it worth upgrading. They've got a good amount of ammunition. Minuscule range, but the missile strength increase is quite nice. Then you have... Chameleon Stalkers, which have low ammunition. Um, they actually have a, a game called a Precursor Missile Weapon. Um, I believe, I don't actually know what I would call their ranged weapon, but they only have two. They run out. It does hit hard, their missile strength. Um, they have limited range. So basically, they throw their missile weapon twice and then they charge into melee. It can be effective because the missile damage is higher. I tend to still go with the Chameleon Skinks. You've got better melee units than any Skink unit on the battlefield. And then finally, you have the finishing to the Skink outdoor spawning pool here. And I don't know if these things would technically be classified as Skinks. Oxigors. Oxigors. I think uh, these are basically like alligators. <laughs> but that walk upright and have giant armor-piercing weapons. So your base one is Proxagor here. These are solid units. Um, they're low, they're high tier units. They're low units. Sorry, they're low numbered units, high tiered infantry. They can take on a lot of stuff. If you're going to fight, say, the Dwarves or Warriors of Chaos, these are great units for that. They will slaughter um, uh, armored units in melee combat, and they're really good at melee combat. They don't die very easily, or if they do die, they tend to take a lot of the enemies with them. The other one here is the Sacred Proxagor, which requires, as I mentioned earlier, the Weapons Crafter Commune. Um, which also, because it ups the recruit rank, makes these guys even stronger. So as you'll see, it is a upgrade here. Melee attack goes up by 10, and it becomes magical. Weapon strength goes up. Maintenance cost shoots up 63, though. Sacred Croxagors are just better than general Croxagors. Um, especially if you're fighting enemies with lots of armor or the, any ethereal traits like uh, vampires. We have high melee resist but are weak to magic. That's the skink tree. The next tree is probably going to be your main infantry tree. This is the underground spawning pool. I like to call it the Soros line versus the skink line. This is your Soros. These are the larger lizardmen. Skinks are small. Um, these guys are going to be your main infantry line so you've got two different lines here you've got ones with maces which are your melee ones and then you've got one with spears which are pretty much your anti-cav unit um i don't tend to build a lot of sora spears without shields because at the next level you get them with shields shielded units are almost always better than non-shielded units if you have the chance it means they don't die as easily to range um they are good if you're fighting an enemy with cavalry like Bretonia. Warriors of Chaos. You have the, uh, basically anything that has cav that they're going to use it. It's worth bringing a couple Soros Spears. Otherwise, I would go with the Soros Warriors. They're expensive, but they're solid. You obviously, once you get to the level 3 settlement and you get Soros Warriors with shields, you want to use those. These guys, solid, middle. They're a mid-tier infantry unit, but I think they're at the higher end of the mid-tier unit. They're hard to kill. It is important to note, though, and I will mention it here, they have this Primal Instinct, which if their hit points fall below 50%, they get stronger, um, which is quite interesting to have them fight. Um, previously, they had a very annoying mechanic where they would go on a rampage and go out of control, but I don't seem to see it anywhere. I don't know if it will be reintroduced, but at least for now, it's not a thing and finally, at the top of the Soros line, you have access to Soros Scar Veterans. This is your melee hero unit. They hit hard. They're hard to kill. 
they're pretty useful. And of course, they do the standard training. And the Lizardmen have powerful lords, especially Soros Scar veterans. So it tends to be worth adding one to your army, especially if your main lord, Tic Tac Toe, or uh, a couple of the others that are skinks, aren't strong in melee. It's worth bringing one of these to kill enemy hero, uh, enemy lords and heroes. Next to that, you have Temple Guards. So this is arguably the most elite infantry unit you get. I consider it slightly better than the Croxagors, but um, they're both high strong units. You don't, you won't go wrong using either of them. However, these guys have halibards, which makes them anti-infantry. They are also armored and shielded. Um, they're a really good unit just in general. They hit hard, they counter almost anything, and they're hard to kill. Um, unlike the Croxagors, they have slightly less armor, but they have shields, so that more than pays off. Right? They do less weapon strength, but there's 100 of them versus 16. Let's give it that one. Then you have a rather interesting line for a total Warhammer faction. You have a flying trait. Most factions don't have flying units. The ones that do don't have dedicated treat uh, dedicated buildings for them lizard men do you have pterodon riders which are basically a flying missile cavalry that attacks from above with like bombs bolas or other ranged units uh, of range weapons um they're okay you can always use them to fly into melee by holding down i believe it's alt by default uh, which makes them quite useful at killing backline archers and artillery be aware that uh, ranged units are their weakness, and uh, they can die rather quickly if, like, say you're fighting the elves and they focus them. Um, otherwise, they do decent damage. They've got good range, got a good amount of ammunition. Uh, in the case of you playing Tic-Tac-Toe, which we're on now, they get a unique um, uh, weapon as well. And finally, the upgrade here, you get Ripper Dactyls, which are non-ranged flying units. These are your anti archers and anti-artillery -ar uh, unit, although the pterodon riders make a nice substitute. These guys hit hard, they're hard to kill, they uh, they affect all the enemies beneath them with, oh sorry this is the wrong one, sorry ripper doctor on this one. They also fear, that's what I meant, they, uh, I can't get to it, but they have a fear ability for the enemies below them, which is really nice, fly them overhead, weaken the enemy leadership, more likely to get routes. Then you've got probably one of the most crazy Lizardman unit, Coaxel. Um, this is straight out of Native American um, Aztec Maya. Basically, the Lizardmen are the Aztec and the Maya, let's be honest. This is a flying feathered serpent unit. It's a support. It's got some great bonuses. Enemy enemies below it. Allies below it get stock, so your entire army outside of this is invisible, which can lead to some very cool ambushes. Uh, very strong in multiplayer battles if used properly. It has a scaly skin, which actually just makes it rather resistant to missiles, making it a flying unit that resists um, range units, which is quite nice. It also has the ability to cast a couple spells, Duranin's Thunderbolt, Lesser Chained Lightning. It does cause terror and fear, which is quite nice. Um, it hexes the enemies with wounds beneath them, and it can fly. It's pretty decent in melee combat with melee magic attacks. It moves quickly, hits hard. It's uh, a very good, it's almost like a dragon. It's basically a dragon, let's be honest. Um, although it doesn't have a breath weapon, but it has magic spells. It's quite fun to use. If you get a chance, it's worth sticking one in the army. It's a shame it comes in the flying line, because even though they do have flying units, they're not the best flying units. Then over here, you have the singular cav building. It has no upgrades, nothing else. It unlocks Cold One Riders and Horned One Riders. So Cold Riders are basically your cav unit. It's not an amazing cav unit. It does its job and basically no more. Um, you can have a base one that basically uses, I think, swords or maces. And then you've got one that uses spears, which is kind of an interesting anti-cav cav unit. Um, it's also anti-monsters, which you tend to use it for more. Uh, honestly, I'd almost take the Spear Riders over the Cold One Riders just because they're anti-large. Um, both cav units will do their job driving away archers or killing artillery or getting some devastating flanks because they're armored, in, armored and shielded, which is quite nice. 
And then finally, you have the Horned Wind Riders, which are your Shock Cav. They're significantly better. They do require a uh, Weapons Crafter Commune here. They hit hard. They do have um, Fear, reducing leadership. Uh, it's quite useful to have one or two of these in the army, especially if you're not investing heavily into flying units, which kind of double as Cav if need be. The shame is it takes one building slot, and it all it gives you is units there's no upgrades but it's worth sticking in a minor settlement somewhere and then recruiting from there and then finally we get into what really makes the lizardmen iconic monstrous units so the first monstrous tree comes from the cult of sotek where you get razor dawn and salamander hunting packs these are quite interesting they are technically aquatic but they're um you're never going to really notice it that much. They're ranged missile units that move fast. This is kind of making up for the fact that the Lizardmen don't have archers. These guys kind of double as archers and also as cavalry. They hit hard. They're armored piercing. That missile damage and range, if left alone, these guys will annihilate enemies. It's kind of similar to like the Skaven uh, flamethrower you and then on the next level, you get Ancient Salamanders, um, which is basically a fire-breathing land dragon kind of thing. Um, does a lot of damage, got good range. This is the start of the monstrous artillery line for the um, uh, Lizardmen. There's other ones, but this is a good start. It's hard, causes terror, is decent in melee combat, does fire great unit to bring if you're fighting the vampire coast or the counts and then finally at the top crimson pyramid of sotek which has a lot of benefits corruption and everything else but the big stuff is it gives you the feral dread saurian which does have rampage um, unlike some of the other lizardman units this is a very solid melee monstrous unit you charge it in it's not going to die that easily causes terror just be aware that it can get surrounded in its leadership all rather quickly. Um, but that's why it can go on rampages and it will just keep attacking enemies over and over. The upgrade to that is the Dread Saurian non feral unit. It is 200 more gold maintenance, but it fires while moving and it does not rampage. Um, it's just a generally good upgrade from this one. Um, the other stats don't change that much other than giving it a ranged. Uh, weapon. The range weapon is very good, so I would replace those with this unless you feel the need to just keep charging Dread Saurians into the enemy and letting them go relatively ballistic. Uh, and then it's worth taking a gander over here. This is your Shrine of the Old Ones, where you get your Skink Priests outside of the Slan Mage Priests. These are your other spellcasters, um, Heavens and Beasts. Makes sense. And then you can get a Skink Oracle as well, higher level. These are hero units, they're magic ones, bring them to help. This one increases mobility, um, which is quite nice for Lizardmen so that you can shoot around the map like you got rocket boots. And then the final tree, and I know this takes a while, but the Lizardmen are a very complex faction. You have your Great Beast chain. So the first one is you get Bastelodons. These are dinosaurs you can put on the battlefield. They are strong, they hit hard, they are very good at... Um, they don't look like they have great melee stats, but they actually are fairly good at melee because they have tons of hit points, they're heavily armored, and their weapon strength is much higher than an average melee unit. These ones are kind of nice that you can build them at level 2. Uh, I do suspect this faction will get a rework or an update at some point, uh, once this might change, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, they have an upgrade here where they get the Altar of Sotek. The Altar of Sotek adds a ranged weapon, basically. Um, you can see, I'm trying to show you the abilities, but the big thing is it... Okay. It brings a Arc of Sotek's Vortex ability, which basically uh, does damage to enemies around it with poison damage over time. Send it in close to melee, um, or if it gets attacked... You activate this, it does damage to everything around it, which is quite nice. And it has a cooldown, so you can use it more than once. Of course, just be aware, it is it starts as a range unit, so it's probably not going to get surrounded by enemies. You'll have to order it forward into melee combat in order to activate that ability. The 
next level, we get to stronger Bastilodons, and we get to Stegodons. The Bastilodons re Revivification Crystal. This is a almost a must-need unit in your Lizardmen armies. Um, because it brings the Revi <laughs> I can't say it. Let's just be honest. It's a strange name. Basically, it brings a revive crystal. You can use it seven times in a battle. It heals allies in range. And more importantly, it resurrects dead combatants. And it heals them before resurrecting. This is basically a vampire count light unit. Remember how I said there are some similarities? This is one of them. Uh, you bring it into the battlefield. You use it when your units are starting to lose a battle or have been in combat for a while. And suddenly your army goes back to almost full strength. Is very nice. It's worth bringing one or even two of these into a battle. So the lizardmen tend to bring a line of infantry backed up by these. Sort of like how the vampires bring a line of skeletons backed up by necromancers. Uh, it's a solid unit. Has some range. So just be aware that it might not be in range of the battle when activating this ability. Which has a decent range, but it's not map wide. Then you get the stegodons, which are an improvement from the Feral Bastilodons for melee combat. Again, hits hard. These have better stats. It's pretty much a flat upgrade, so I would upgrade to this one. This one can go on a rampage, be aware, so you might lose control of it. And then you get to some of the very fun stuff. You get a Bastilodon with a solar engine. Basically, the Lizardmen don't get artillery. They get monsters with artillery. This is the funnest part of playing the Lizardmen. You get a long-ranged, hard-hitting, uh, range attack that also blinds and weakens melee defense and accuracy. This thing will annihilate archers or artillery, or you can just use it on melee units and watch them as they suddenly, their stats plummet to virtually nothing. Um, they are a siege attacker, as are most of the dinosaurs, and they have this wonderful beam of Chotek, which is the range attack. It's pretty epic to see on the battlefield. It hits hard. Um, I recommend at least uh, one of the Revive Crystals and one of the Solar Engines at minimum in a late game army. You might even consider bringing more. This allows you to wait, force the enemies to come to you if they don't have artillery, rather than you having to charge them, which to be honest is kind of the Lizardmen thing prior to this. Then you get an Ancient Stegodon, which is even stronger. This is, again, has Engine of the Gods. You get Burning Alignment, which is a spell cast, quite cool, in the area. And more importantly, you get the Portent of Warding. So this is a unit you want to send into melee combat or right behind them, and it will give a 5% damage resistance sword saves to all the allies nearby. So ideally, you want your units fighting around its feet. Um, this adds up. 5% damage resistance sword save is pretty powerful in the long run also causes terror as well which is quite nice and then you've got a stegodon which is again an artillery monster uh, it has a longer range than the solar engine but it's just kind of cool um the one with the solar engine is just rather neat this is just pure artillery this high damage high range you can upgrade from the solar engine straight to this it's a flat upgrade um have it in your army late game and then finally you get to the feral carnosaurs, the T-Rexes, or supersized, uh, whatever those monsters were from Jurassic Park that hunted everybody. can't remember it. Uh, Hard-hitting, fast-moving, kind of replaces a cab unit. Be aware it can go on a rampage. Is armor-piercing, but it is, almost all of these are sold into the units where they can get surrounded and routed or hacked to bits. So you should always back them up with infantry if you can. Then you've got Feral Troglodons. Uh, again, look at the range, but look at the missile strength. <laughs> it is crazy. 800 damage. These things hit, hit really hard. Um, these are kind of like tanks for this Age of Warfare. High armor, high leadership, decent melee stats, high bonuses all around. Slightly lower ammunition than I would like, but hey, can't ask for everything. And then you've got Ancient Stegodons, which have... Uh, reduced range. Your longest range unit is this artillery monster, I believe. Um, so you might actually not upgrade to the ancient ones just so that you keep the uh, needed range. These guys hit harder, better stats otherwise, though. And that is the roster for the Lizardmen.
The strategy usually is a solid line of hard infantry backed up by a reviving crystal and um, sometimes a ward saving one. Uh, uh, the engines of the gods one here, I believe. Yeah. Ancient Stegodon, engine of the gods. Have two of those in the armies. Solid line of either temple guards or croxagors backed up by maybe a flying unit, coaxal, or even some calf to flank. And then you basically charge at the enemy or use the artillery to force them to come to you. The odds are melee combat, you're going to win. Um, Lizardmen are very powerful in melee. The only things that really stop them are dwarf units, late game, um, I, uh, late game uh, warriors of chaos units. They tend to have better than almost everybody else. Okay, well, let's talk economy. So obviously... The Lizardmen, as I mentioned earlier, have a couple different buildings uh, that in the major settlements, you can get an income from all buildings boost. It's worth building one of these in almost every major settlement. Uh, first off, it improves your geomantic web, also boosts your income. In the minor settlements, you might want to throw down a tablet of stone marker for the tech, but also from the income from buildings. You can get 12 stacked with eight twice. All of a sudden, you're looking at like 30... 34% more income from the province, which is quite nice, considering your tech also boosts your income periodically. Lizardmen have a standard growth building. It's worth snagging for the technology building and uh, the replenishment. Even though it doesn't directly give you money, this is the building you probably want to build first in either your minor settlement or your major settlement, barring, of course, garrisons, unique units, or if you need the money. But you want to get this down early, so that you can get to your higher level stuff. Again, Blizzardmen are a later game faction unit. They're not bad. Their Soros early on are really powerful, but they really need to get to tier four or five in capitals so that they get their high level dinosaur unit. They have one income building, which is your Skink Favelas. If you needed any more indication, these are supposed to be like Mexican, Aztec, and Mayas. This would give it to you. It gives a pretty good income. Uh, it costs 500, gives you 200, repays in three turns. Again, all numbers subject to change as the beta continues. And then at the next level, 300, finally 400. Takes a while to pay off there. Um, doesn't grow racial-wise, but it does unlock a technology. And the other things I should quick mention is they've got a monument here, which gives control. Lizardmen tend to need one of these in every um, region, preferably in your capital settlement, uh, if you want to get all the way up. To the final upgrade and get 10 controls at which point you're probably not going to have any revolts whatsoever they have a lizardman control building this might be worth building especially if you're fighting the skaven sorry not lizardman control they have a skaven control building and they are the lizardmen this will prevent plagues from spreading so if you're fighting uh nurgle factions or you're fighting the plague spreading skaven faction um this will help stop the Endless Plagues, plus it roots out Skaven and has a chance of discovering Undercities, which, to be fair, the Skaven AI doesn't build that much of, but they tend to start with one or two somewhere that can cause some problems. And of course, the Lizardmen have very good garrisons. Um, it's worth mentioning this as part of the economy, because this will prevent you from losing your settlements and losing all that precious money. The, the units you get from a capital garrison for the Lizardmen are nuts. They are really strong units. You get Croxagors, Soros Warriors. They are amazingly good on defense. Um, usually you have to bring two armies to take out a Lizardmen settlement with a garrison. Even their minor settlement garrisons, which of course you only want to build when the settlement hits level three. Level two, it's less effective. Level three gives you the walls. Um, Soros Warriors, Soros Spears, it makes taking a Lizardmen settlement considerably stronger because their garrison is already half decent um, tends to make the enemy need one if you put, uh, one full army or even two if you play well you can hold out against immensely superior enemies as the lizard okay let's talk technology so the lizard men have in my opinion the second most annoying tech tree that i've played with in this game the only one that might beat it is the skavens the Lizard Men tech tree is locked behind buildings, which means early on you're probably going to only have one path of research till you expand and then you'll get more. So all this red indication, if you hover over it, tells you what buildings you need to build. In case 
Tactico starts with the Table of Beasts unlocked. In fact, he starts with two technologies researched. This is a common point, uh, common pattern for the Lizardmen Lords. They tend to start with one path unlocked at the start with their buildings. And in order to unlock it, you need to build more. So the table, the building that gives growth unlocks recruitment costs and recruit rank. If you build the minor income boosting building in your minor settlements, it will unlock this one, which gives leadership, income, and movement range. A very good one to get, especially for the movement range. Table of Order, which is a scrying pool, improves heroes. I don't tend to build it early on. 5% um, diplomatic relations is almost a joke. Then you get Monument of, uh, this is, I believe, the public order building, gives some growth, construction costs. Table of Crafts, this is your, um, that is this building, your, ink, your industry building. By the way, if you click on it, it will jump to it, which is a very nice thing. It will boost your income, boost your trade goods, allow you to build resource buildings faster. It, this is worth getting. Just even the 5% from industry makes your industry buildings even more effective. Table of Skinks requires a skink building. Um, table of Soros. Soros building required. Um, if you're going to use skinks, you definitely want this for poison attacks, ammunition, vanguard, missile strength, weapon strength. It makes the skinks slightly less bad to use. They're still not amazing. And the table of Soros just makes your Soros units, which should be the core of your infantry till you get like high level temple guards and stuff. Um, that much better. 5% melee attack and defense makes them really good. Okay. Uh, I had to step away for a moment, so I've kind of lost my train of thought. Um, up here is the unlock for the next section of your tech tree. You need to build a scrying pool. Oh, sorry. You have to build ziggurat of the old one. No, it's not. That's okay. That's wrong. Scrying pool is over here. For some reason, it's linking to this one rather than this. One. Scrying pool is here. Uh, it also unlocks technologies here, but you have to build it to unlock this one which gives you control, and then it unlocks this next tier of tech. You obviously have to research to here where you can get going. This is where you start to see some substantial boosts to your tech bonuses. Um, this table of order, first three, are not that great. Remember how I mocked the diplomatic relations with Lizardmen and High Elf? Well, their next one gives corruption in all your provinces, which is pretty useful. Uh, and then it even further, it gives you even more corruption reduction. So definitely you want to build a scrying pool. Um, once you've gotten one or two to here, it might not be worth building it early. You'll figure it out. It's The tech management's annoying, but it's not particularly difficult to understand. It's not necessarily worth racing to get this unlocked unless you know exactly what you're going for because the basic stuff is still pretty good. And then it continues down here. Again, if you're using Soros, you want to take the Soros ones. There's no real boost for the Skink. There's a little bit, but again, it boosts Croxigors, which you'd be using as well. And then finally, determining the Great Plan requires a Star Chamber and a Weapons Crafter Commune. So it requires this and requires this. This one can be built at minor settlements. These two have to be built at major settlements. As you do, it unlocks the final tree, which is very powerful. Secret of geometric healing is very much worth getting. Now, you have to research down here, which can be slightly confusing. Uh, you'll figure it out once you get there. I don't want to confuse people too much. Uh, and generally, it just boosts everything. This one's worth it, because if you get a gold mine, 200 income from mines and quarries is kind of nuts. And again, boost to temple guards, and then decreased upkeep. All told makes it very powerful. For some reason, it feels like there should be more techs over here, but there isn't. Anyway, that is the Lizardman tech tree. Well, since we're here, we'll cover Tic-Tac-Toe. So Tic-Tac-Toe is, in my opinion, the least interesting of the Lizardman uh, legendary lords. So we'll just cover him rather quickly. So Tic-Tac-Toe is a skink lord who starts off flying in the air, which is quite interesting. He's, I think he's the only Lord to start with a flying mount at the beginning of the game. I could be wrong. Uh, he has a unique line where he basically drops a bomb. 
from above to hit enemies, and he can boost his army when attacking. If anything, he's probably the most offensive of the Lizardmen Lords. He has good boosts to his flying Pterodon Riders, which he gives a unique weapon to. Increased replenishment, recruitment rank, missile strength. Guess what he's supposed to use? He's supposed to be the flying Lizardmen Lord. The only weak the only problem I see with this is the Lizardmen flying units are not they don't have enough depth, really. They need like another unit or two, in my opinion. Uh, standard blue line here. It's really up to what you what you're gonna do. By and large, the lizardmen are gonna be fighting non um, untainted factions, so factions with corruption. So getting fervent as well could be useful. Bonded service is not bad on the lizardmen. Their dinosaur units tend to be rather expensive, um, and generally they have a very expensive army, similar to the dwarves. Getting draft man uh, master is great. Lightning Strike can be very powerful, uh, especially if you're fighting, out, uh, you're outnumbered the, with the enemies you're fighting. Geomantic Sustenance decreases upkeep, always good. Wary, if you're worried about getting ambushed, which if you're fighting a lot of Skaven, you should be. Um, it's worth getting. Gifts of the Jungle, replenishment rate up to six, always get this. Renowned and feared increases movement range. Then you got Standard Blessing. This is for most of the Lizardmen Lord. You can only pick one of these have various effects pick your blessing based off what type of units you're going to use so this one is clearly oriented towards making uh building up this one's oriented towards soros and temple guard units if you're going to use these for an infantry core of your army this is almost always the one you want to pick difference is this one is magic this one is income from battles and ambushing so this is a defensive one this one is casualty replenishment control and untainted if you're going to go on some insane quests to the chaos waste this will be more useful if not don't bother with it uh, the replenishment rate is nice i mean it's really good um but if you stick one of the skink um uh one uh, it's not one of the skink mages um it's the upgraded version seer or whatever uh it gives casualty replenishment right there so it's not as needed and then this one which you'll probably want to put on tic-tac-toe gives even lower upkeep for pterodon riders and flying units and increases damage during ambushes and stuff um considering he's all about the flying units this allows him to have a very cheap core of flying units uh, i will mention that flying units cannot hold a battlefield so you still need it, some units on the ground otherwise you will lose so his unique faction stuff, he has a right that increases the movement range of all his armies when used, which I covered earlier. All skink heroes start mounted on flying units. He has a further line of sight, and his pterodons get to drop a bomb rather than dropping and throwing bolos at enemy. Similar to what he has. It makes pterodons better. It doesn't really solve the problem. Pterodons aren't super amazing units, in my opinion. And in terms of actual Lord skills, he has a decreased 50% upkeep for Pterodon riders and flying units in general, and an increased melee attack when you're in foreign territory. All told, if you attack in foreign territory, you get plus 15 melee attack on all your units. As I said, this guy is the offensive one. And if you take Blessing of Itzel, you'll have negative 70% upkeep for your flying units and some of your ancient lizard, which is quite nice. Now, in terms of his starting location, he starts in the southern part of the Nekara Deserts, right on the border with the jungles. Kalakwa is a standard large settlement, nothing particularly special. It does have a pasture, which can be worth building early on. Replenishment and growth helps get you to the higher levels. You can take Deadhead's Monument here. And this is something I'm sure they'll change, but almost none of the Lizardmen can fight their starting battle and then go on to take a settlement, which is unique from all the factions I've tried so far, basically. they You want to fight the first battle, which you fight here. Then you want to move back just over the border into your territory and recruit units. Then next turn, you can take Deadhead's Monuments. That's why this started on turn two. Uh, they have a half-decent port building, um, obviously. You automatically have it built, and it's worth upgrading when you get the chance. Afterwards, you want to take Statues of the God to give you your first starting region. And then down here, this is another area owned by the same Greenskins you were fighting at the beginning.
getting. It's worth going down here to try and take this settlement and this one if you can. Sure. That will give you um, two starting, two capital settlements, one region. And then if you I believe Country Glades is a ruin, I haven't checked yet. Uh, if it starts as a ruin, if it does colonize it, it'll give you two full provinces. Good terrain for you. Now, this is where problems start. It's very easy to consolidate this, right? And by and large, since there's lizardsmen to yourself, instantly to yourself, you're half decently safe. Problem is, further to yourself is the Teach faction down here, or Siege faction, people keep reminding me. And they will cause trouble. In fact, they'll probably declare war on you around that time if they haven't wiped out the Lizardmen faction yet. Uh, in which case, it might be worth marching down uh, Teclis of the High Elves is over here. If he doesn't die, which can happen, he might prove a half-decent ally versus uh, the uh, faction down there. Over here is um, another Lizardman faction, uh, the Last Defenders. If you can ally yourself with them, it's worth it. Uh, you want to confederate them later. But in the meantime, they will handle things in this area, where there's a lot of enemies, while you focus on the desert. This is where the other problem arises. So up here is a the Cult of Sigmar under Volkmar the Grim. He will tend to try and expand here, but the big threat comes from Manfred von Karstein, uh, who will rapidly take over this area from Tomb Kings. He may declare war on you. If he does, crush him. If he doesn't, it might be worth trying to get a non-aggression pact with him. And so you can finish off the Siege faction first. Um, at which point you might have to go in against them as well. Be aware, the Cult of Sigmar sometimes wants to be friends, sometimes wants to be enemies in my experience. Um, if you can get a trade agreement with them, even if it costs some money, uh, they tend not to attack you. Uh, there is an ogre faction up here, uh, located right here, that tends to be rather aggressive and attack you. Uh, in general, this area is a mess. It's chaotic. There are dwarves over here which you can get along with. They tend not to be anti-lizardmen, but they can be. And there's a wood elf faction right here, uh, Orion's Bowmen, who will probably declare a war on you. They don't tend to be too aggressive. It's worth marching in and wiping them out. Just be aware, if you take their settlement, you can't put walls on it, so it's very difficult to defend. Uh, at which point, you're probably going to want to keep expanding northward, killing the... Um, uh, corn faction, I think it's our brand over here, and then expanding further up, at which point you'll come into contact with the other lizard men, or you can go south, take on Teclis, and if you're crazy, you can even invade the southern chaos waste area down there. That is Tic Tac Toe. He's not my favorite lizard man, but he is probably uh, just the most basic lizard men start. Okay, here we are. This is the last defenders, Krogar. So Krogar starts right to the east of Tic-Tac-Toe. You can see Sung Tree Glade from Tic-Tac-Toe. You can see it from Krogar's start as well. So Krogar starts with a minor settlement, which is a bit of a pain. Thankfully, this minor settlement comes with the Golden Tower of the Gods, which just gets you 600 income, control, research rate, and corruption. It's an amazing building. Build this, build a garrison building, Upgrade the Soros building, and this settlement is an amazing settlement for a starting uh, minor settlement. Now, Krogar starts up here with a battle versus these uh, Skaven. Once you beat them, the temptation is truly to march down here and take the settlement. You can't win that battle on auto resolve. You can win that battle if you micro and, or you fight it. That is, if you wanted to spend like a 15, 20 minute load in, load out right now. Hopefully that speeds up. Uh, otherwise, you will have to retreat to your territory and build up. If you're not going to fight the battle, don't march forward and try and siege this down. Um, they will counterattack and try and kick you off. Just simply, after you win the battle, go back and build up. Otherwise, you're going to have to spend another turn marching back, turn training, turn marching back. It'll be like turn four before you take the settlement. Uh, you have a non-aggression pack down here with Teclis. It's worth getting trade agreements with him early on. Keep him happy. He will go south, by and large, uh, if he doesn't die. And then again, he'll engage the Siege 
faction down there. Uh, you might have to aid him, depending on how his war goes or what Tic-Tac-Toe does. However, your expansion route is heading up north into the Cursed Jungle and then further along this coast where the Skaven live. If you can, it is worth um, conquering and invading that whole area. And uh, you want to do this with some rapidity. You want to do it rather quickly because the other factions will invade this area. There are, is the dwarf faction up here of Karak Zorn. Ironbrow. Sorry about that. He's rather loud today. Uh, if you can, you want to try and get a non-aggression pact with him. He'll make a very good trading partner. And he proves is a proves to be a rather nice buffer state controlling this mountain. If he gets the chance to expand and Manfred doesn't kill him. He will tend to control this area and prevent anyone from crossing the mountains easily. If he dies to Manfred, it is worth marching up here and taking Karagzorn and taking out Manfred. Because this will get you a gold mine. Old mines are almost always worth it. And Crox, uh, sorry, Rogar uh, has a different right. He has the right of Sotek, which causes attrition to enemies in your territory. This is a semi-generic right that was replaced by Tic-Tac-Toe's movement. It increases missile strength. This basically boosts your skink, your early game stuff, early game cheat, you, cheap units, makes them stronger, allows you to ambush better. This is a purely defensive right. It's very useful, especially if you have a large province that the enemy has to march for a while to get to. Not so useful here because the Golden Towers map does not extend particularly far this way. If someone was invading this area, it would take them a turn to march, a turn or more to march between settlements to be stronger. Now, Krogar himself is the Soros Lord, which he kind of shares with another one. I'd say he's even more focused on it. First off, any army led by the Soros um, Old Bloods is cheaper to maintain. This is an interesting one because it boosts the Lord's leading armies, which means basically every army you have should be led by a Soros Old Blood outside of your starting army. As you level up the Soros recruitment chain, the buildings give you bonuses. This is kind of hard to see. At level 1, it un enables them. At level 2, it increases the recruit rank faction-wide for them. And then at level 3, it gives recruit rank 2 as well. So if you have 10 of these and they're all level 3, you'll be recruiting immortal Soros Scar veterans like crazy. Plus, you'll have the capacity to build quite a few of them, at least 10. You could have an army mostly filled with immortal Soros Scar veterans, which would be kind of terrifying, if not slightly weak. Now, Krogar himself has a skill... Uh, he's the last defender, which means the upkeep of his armies is generally cheaper. Soros warriors and cold one riders gain experience faster, and he's having ambush. So, despite me saying he's kind of a Soros lord, the only reason I say that is pretty much because he has the reduced upkeep, and uh, he has the experience gain. Outside of that, there's another character, the Lizardman, that has more to the Soros. He's got a very interesting tree. It's very different. Than the other lizardmen. It has the same blue and red lines as the other lizardmen, and even a pretty good uh, yellow line. He's a decent melee fighter already. This makes him insanely better. What makes him unique is not only does he get the blessings, which you can pick whichever you like. If you're going to use Soros, you stack it with this. Negative 35 upkeep for Soros and Temple Guards, yes please, is very useful. Otherwise, he's a person you could argue could use the casualty replenishment rate. Again, those are the major two I would take. Make up your mind. What makes him unique is he has this rank 10 option where he can kind of specialize who he's fighting. So if he's fighting the Skaven still, he can boost leadership, weapon strength, and make his army immune to contact effects. But he can also take all these other ones. So if you're going to fight the dwarves, pick this to help you fight the dwarf. It boosts his army. Unfortunately, it's not a mat faction-wide bonus. But it makes his army a lot better at fighting one or each type of enemy. All told, his army with one of these traits probably is going to be the strongest and one of the cheapest of the Lizardmen factions. Compared to some of the other ones, his faction is relatively straightforward. Just, you know, upkeep reduction and Soros Scar veterans and stuff. Overall, though, it's simple sometimes makes him just as strong. He hits hard, his army gets stronger than almost anyone else's, and he can focus almost everybody. 
He also has the unique Honored Elder, um, which we didn't see on Tic-Tac-Toe because he's a skink. This is a Soros one. Troll, ward save, and even more reduced upkeep. Pretty powerful. He also gets a Carnosaur as his mount. As you can see, is a weakening to his melee attack and defense, but overall a general buff. When you get this, put him on it. It's very powerful. Um, makes him very hard to kill. It's hard still. Very powerful lord. He pretty much charges in at the head of your army or close to it. Doesn't die. He also gets a spear, which is useful because it gives him ma magic attacks and weakens leadership. Plus, it boosts control, meaning he less he's one of the few lords that doesn't necessarily have to build the whole building that, say, Tic-Tac-Toe might have to build. And then Hand of the Gods, word save, boosts him overall. He gets a magic missile spell, which is strange, but can be useful in certain circumstances. So, that is Krogar. He's not the most interesting of lords. The decreased upkeep. Just make sure your armies are led by Soros Old Bloods, and you can support 15% more units than any other Lizardman faction. Okay, time for probably my least favorite Lizardman lord, Lord Madzamundi. Uh, very strong Lizard Lord, don't get me wrong. I just hate his start. He starts with the single province of Hexoatl. Uh, it is a unique settlement because it has 10 building slots. Uh, it starts off with a pretty good garrison and plenty of spells. It has a gold mine, which you want to build immediately. Uh, and probably get a growth and a great beast. The reason I don't like this start is you start off at war with the Slanesh faction to your west and north. You start off war with a Norska faction to your east. And even these nice humans over here tend to declare war on you rather quickly. So just like the other min lizard men lords, your, your initial battle you can win easily with auto resolve or fighting it. Taking the settlement afterwards, fallen gates, is almost impossible unless you put it fighting the battles yourself. So retreat back to his starting area, build up the army, probably Soros warriors. Um, this is why building a taming pen can be useful. Um, once you do that, you want to take Fallen Gates, then march south, take Macau Peaks. It's probably built up their army again. In which case, if you sit in ambush right here, they tend to march out and die to your ambush. Then you can finish them off. Then you have a starting region. These Dark Elves to your north are going to die to Marathi. But in the meantime, you can usually get a non-aggression pact with them. Be aware that there is a Skaven faction working right here. They want to go off. And then at that point, you want to go east and try and finish off the Skaven. Eggy Skaven. You have a settlement here, here, and then one up here. This one up here is interesting because either Marathi will kill them, or if you invade to kill them, Marathi will tend to declare war on you if you occupy it. If you raise it, it might give you a little bit of protection from her. Otherwise, that is probably going to be your main enemy for a while. Marathi to the north. If Marathi doesn't attack you, what you want to do is you want to race south and try and secure this area down here. Kill off these annoying human factions. They basically will never like you. and They will declare war. It's just worth killing them when you can. At which point, you'll run across either Marcus Wolfhart, if he's down here, or the Bretonian faction, if for some reason Wolfhart has died to the Bretonian faction. Or you could even run across Dark Elves expanding up the coast. Regardless, you're going to fight somebody over this area. If you stop prior to going south, there's a chance that then you can fight Marathi. Overall, though, you just want to consolidate your little Isthmus area here and build up. You're surrounded by enemies on all sides. Not a very good starting position. It's, I'd say it's slightly better than it was in Total Warhammer 2, but not by much. Also, be aware you're very close to a underworld sea lane. In fact, you're rather close to two underworld sea lanes. So if for some reason, once you secure your starting region, you get bored, you can go travel to the boy, travel, um, travel right away, all the way over to the Sea of Malice and have fun over there. Uh, or you could sail south and travel elsewhere as well to the Jade Sea and then have fun elsewhere. The odds are you're going to be fighting all your enemies around you and you probably will never use the travel lane, not till late game. Uh, it's a pain playing as him, in my opinion, just because you have a lot of enemies and he doesn't have a lot of melee bonus. 
This guy is a magic user. First off, penalty to all relations with factions is just kind of annoying. I hope this gets changed because even Warriors of Chaos don't have a general lower opinion. Everybody just hates them. Basically, nobody likes you as this guy. Maybe he's arrogant or something. Regardless, he is constructing star chambers are cheaper. If you remember what a star chamber does, a star chamber increases the recruitment rate for slan mage priests, reduces attrition, gives you money, recruits your heroes higher levels. If you build four or five or six of these, you'll start recruiting very high level hero units. Um, his strengths are less melee and a little bit more magic buffing. It can be a little tricky to play with. In terms of his actual ability, he has magic. He basically gets magic. His spells cast him further. He's more likely to have a reserve of magic, armies heal. It's all about the temple guards. This is the faction for the temple guards, so this they should be the core of your army. And he basically never messes up his spells. Standard blue line, standard red line. He has storms and healing. Um, spell line. It's worth going down this camera. Comet of Cassandora is very powerful. Plus, since he has more magic than average, this will help him. And then up top, he's got some very cool stuff. First off, he gets a Stegodon, which makes his melee skills go up. Less likely to die. I still would not throw him in melee. I'd use his range cast from a distance. Now we'll have range and ammunition when you're not casting spells. Um, he has some very interesting stuff. First off, he gets a barrier, which is something they added um, for Warhammer 3 to the Siege faction. He gets a barrier. Uh, his miscast becomes negative 90. He basically never miscasts. He causes terror just being around him, plus control to regenerate, which is nice. It means he's hard to kill. And his barrier replenishes faster. This allows you to run him forward, have him take damage from range or melee, retreat, regenerate, Retreat before he loses 800 hit points and then repeat. Then we get his really powerful magic stuff. First off, his magical winds of power magic reserve minimum is 10, which means you will always be able to cast a spell in battle, regardless of what the winds of magic are in the province or your army. He reduces the chance the enemies nearby get winds of magic if they try to increase winds of magic in the province he's in. I don't see this one as particular useful because usually they either come in with winds of magic or they don't have any winds of magic at all then he gets a chance to increase his winds of magic reserve nice and then he gets just a great spell of banishment which hits hard um, in a large radius uh, can be very useful against uh, vampires tomb kings main units are rather weak uh, it's good against armor which is nice so uh, just use it every time it doesn't cost uh of magic to use, you should be dropping it in every fight, ideally on a huge group of enemies, either while they're engaged with the units or while if they pile up anywhere. Hit them with this, does a lot of damage. Then you get Ruination of Cities. Again, doesn't use Winds of Magic. It's hard in an area, sends out rifts, affects the unit if they're grounded, so cast it on land units, ideally, and watch the carnage erupt. This guy is a pure. Magic caster, use it that way. He gets a sunburst status, which boosts all the allies in an area. Pick this on temple guards, it boosts everybody around it. Your temple guards are even more annoying to kill. Then he gets the Cobra Mace, reduce corruption, boosts his melee attack. This makes him viable in melee combat, especially with the barrier. Well, caster though, so use him how you will, but it means he's no longer incompetent. At combat. Now, in terms of rituals, he has the same ones as Krogar. Just be aware that if you want priests, this guy's whole thing is getting better slam mage priests. This is how you do it. Cast it once you own 20 units, 10 turn cooldown. Once you do it, however, you do not get the unit on the map, you still have to raise them. If you don't have the recruitment capacity, you start to run into some problems. So enjoy. I don't like him that much. Have fun. It's very hard to get any geomantic web with this location. Eliminate here, eliminate here, either go north and south, and then have fun. You'll probably be at war most of the game. Okay, here we go. This is Tia 
T. Hen Huatin, or however you say it. This guy is the other skink focused leader. So this guy starts here on the southern bottom of Flustria, not far away from the chaos stuff, a bit south of the Itzel faction, Tomb Kings on one side, uh, fighting Skaven. So this guy is, again, we're starting to get into the rather unique Skaven, I'm sorry, not Skaven, um, Lizardmen Lords. This guy is arguably one of the most interesting. Uh, there's one more, so we'll cover him quickly. So he, first off, he has a 200% upkeep for Soros Infantry and Temple Guards until you complete stage one of the Prophecy of Sotek. You get sacrificial offerings when you capture people, and the right of Sotek is cheaper. The right of Sotek is the ambush boost skink one, so you're going to be wanting to use this pretty consistently because this guy has to use skinks until he completes part of the Prophecy. What is the Prophecy, you ask? That's his unique mechanic. Up top is the Prophecy of Sotek. The first one, you have to own two full provinces and perform five sacrificial rituals, at which point you unlock tier two sacrifices and this penalty goes away. Then you complete stage two of it, which is fighting Skaven. And then finally you get Sotek's Manifest. This is kind of interesting because as you progress down it, you can do stuff like in Total Warhammer 2, you could cause all Lizardmen factions to declare war on all Skaven factions, which was quite interesting. Um, Basically, you can cause some major changes to the way the game is played using this prophecy. It's a pain to get further. I can't show you the other requirements because I haven't unlocked them at turn one. Um, now, that coincides with his sacrifices. You get sacrifices from everyone you fight. You can use them to gain stuff like Jungle Swarm, an ability that it's enemies in an area. Casualty replenishment. This is going to be the one you're going to probably use the most. Plus 15% in all armies. This is amazing because it lasts 10 turns and then you just recast it again. Um, replenishment of 15% early on is amazing. It goes very well with your skinks because you're going to be taking lots of damage and losing a fair amount of them. Replenishes them. You can lose leadership of skinks. Give your units armor. And over here, you can unlock Blessed Spawnings using Sacrifice. Usually, Lizardmen get Blessed Spawnings from completing missions. And this is a good time to talk about them, because I haven't talked about them either. I was waiting for this guy. On the Lizardmen, you have a middle one called Blessed Spawnings, where you can recruit a very st a stronger version of a base unit. You have to complete missions or get them through events. When you get them, they can be recruited instantly. And uh, they're very powerful units. Um, I think you get them for free. You get them. You can deploy them for free. Uh, they still have upkeep. They're really solid. They're great units. The problem is that you get them so irregularly, you can't really base a strategy on them. This guy is the exception. He can control his blessed spawnings. He can select as he goes up the tree and pays the sacrifices. He can unlock specific blessed spawnings. And some of them up at the top, are rather powerful. You can just get Blessed Stegodons with 800 sacrifices. Um, I really like this. The problem is fighting with just skinks early on is kind of a pain. But once you pull it off, it can be very, very powerful. So, as you'll see, there's a starting battle here. Add this guy to your army. Fight this battle if you want to. And then you're going to have to retreat to your territory. You can't, unless you micro fight the battle, we're not going to here. Um, you're not going to be able to win it. So you could do eat and kill, which for the Skaven, uh, sorry, for the Lizardman recovers your health. Or you can do sacrifice the Sotuk, which gives you the same replenishment and the captives. You basically always want to do the sacrifice. You could try and take the settlement. If you're going to micro command it, you can win it with your lords and the Croctagore and Salamanders. If you're going to auto resolve, retreat. And you'll see you have a full complement of skink units available to you. So the best ones to build here are usually red crested and chameleons. They're going to be your strongest one. You start with a fair amount of range, so probably red crested. You might have to build up for two to three turns to be able to take this settlement, unless you're going to micro fight it. Your capital is a minor settlement, which means taking this quickly is very important. You can start getting good stuff. 
you start with the ability to recruit skink chiefs. You do not have one on the battlefield to start, so it's worth raising one. Um, even though you have a Sora Scar veteran, find those, recruit with three heroes, and a one turn of recruitment and take that settlement. Just remember to do the recruitment. Now you have a dark uh, high elves to your east. Get a trade agreement with them. They won't attack you with a non-aggression pact and trade. And in the meantime, you'll generate some money from them. You may want to kill them later, but for now, it's not worth it. Your capital settlement here, you've got choices of what to do. I tend to build a garrison building just so there's no chance that I lose my capital against a random roaming army. To get it to three, fully upgrade it. Less of a problem once you take my axe and take a while to get it if you don't stand the battle. Once you've taken it, you've got a couple options. One, you can go north, fight Skaven and Corn factions, or you can attack the Lizardmen fact uh, with the Lizardmen, you can attack the Tomb King factions and gain this coast. Be aware there are Dark Elves up here, and if you go that way, you're committing to that fight. Your whole thing is fighting Skaven, though, so uh, going north to fight the Skaven factions, not a bad option. You start with the Lizardmen faction here. Right now, they tend not to die as fast as they used to in Total Warhammer 2, because it changes to the map and stuff. But at some point, they will die, in which case you can rush into their lands. Or you can try and ally them early, and then keep them alive to confederate later. Also, can we point out how cool these graphics look with these aqueducts? They look really cool. Uh, this is probably one of the nicest looking areas of the map. Some dev put a lot of time into this. Um, and for the rights, obviously we already talked about it, but right of Sotek, very powerful early on, considering you're going to have the skinks. If you want a guaranteed taking of this settlement, and for some reason you're struggling, recruit the hero, add him, recruit two skink units, then recruit two more, so waste two turns recruiting, then pop this right of Sotek, which requires you to recruit three skink units. Cast it, march in, you will take that settlement, no trouble. Now, in terms of him as an actual lord, he has, first off, he starts off with a unique weapon, which is very unique, having a weapon as well. Um, reduces corruption, quite nice. In terms of his actual stats, gets bonuses when you're fighting Skaven, and his skinks have physical resistance, again, making not a great unit slightly better. He is a fanatic, so he can boost his physical resistance and attack versus enemies make his skinks considerably stronger, but this costs him access to the promises of reconstruction, gives him more income, magic, better replenishment, and enlightenment. This gives you sacrificial offerings for the turn, which can be useful. It's just, just a low amount. You require like 200 for basic sacrifice. So it takes quite a while. I recommend Fanatic. Makes him stronger, makes his army significantly stronger, makes skinks significantly better with the melee defense and armor and attack as well. It basically makes them uh, Soros units, but are much cheaper to build and maintain. Now, he's got standard blue, standard red lines. This is where you could make an argument to go down the skirmisher on the red line to boost skinks, melee defense, and range. Um, kind of cool that way. Obviously, the Soros units are still better, um, but they're more expensive for you initially. So. This is something that if you're struggling, throwing a couple points into this, boost your skinks might be worth it. Now, he has lore of beasts, which is not the strongest of lore, but it's pretty good. Uh, so he functions as a spellcaster. I tend to focus, obviously, more into the blue line, to buff your army, in which case, getting gifts of the jungle, renowned beard, lightning strike, draft, draft master, all of this is very good. And then later on, you want to be on the Engine of the Gods for all the benefits that that gives you. And attack from range, boost other people in general. You become an offensive faction further on you go. And the fact that you can control your blessed spawnings to get really, really good units, like blessed Tarnasaurs, over and over, means this guy will have a very strong blessed army as he progresses further in. He does start with the Table of the Skinks unlocked. Definitely start researching it if you want the bonuses to skin. And that is uh, 
this guy whose name I can't really pronounce. I will mention that this one is a unique uh, quest thing, and it will boost his leadership and damage resistance when he's casting. This is probably one of the weakest quest items I've ever gotten, so I'm mentioning it here because you probably don't want to hurry to get this quest done. It's, the benefits are not really worth it. And that's it. On to the next lord. Okay, here we are with Gorok. Not to be confused with Krogar. Uh, this is the Soros lord I was talking about earlier. Um, it's all about the Soros. So, first off, you start here in Itza with a gold mine. Build the gold mine. Level up your settlement. It's worth it. It's a strong one. This is it. It's, and at some point, you'll want to build the walls. This is your core province with great unique buildings. You don't want to lose this ever. Um, which this guy is very defensive, so it's pretty easy to defend. So, let's look over Gorok, and then we'll talk about the giant floating mummy in a chair. So Gorok is about the protector of Itza. His units have more mass, so when they charge in enemies, they hit much harder and they're harder to knock back. As far as I understand it, it's a very confusing mechanic. As missile resistance, his units are good against fighting enemies with arrows or other ranged weapons. That is his only two effects, but that's a pretty powerful two effects. He personally is a very defensive fighter. He's pretty good at it. He's not going to outduel anybody, but he tends not to die to trash units. Standard blue line, standard red line, standard yellow line, standard blessings. Okay? He is about the Soros. This is the guy you will want to take the blessing of Quetzal. 100%. Boost upkeep is. Now, he's got unrelenting assault, perfect vigor. He will never tire in battle, makes him much stronger. Physical resistance. Then he gets spell and melee defense, making him even harder to hit. Then physical resistance for all his Soros and melee defense. Again, we're noticing a Soros theme here. This is really powerful. It means the Soros are painfully hard to kill. Uh, it doesn't apply to Temple Guards, though. They don't really need it. Unflinching. Monty Python reference. It's a flesh wound. Uh, Gets stronger if he has less than 50% hit points, and he's unbreakable. Now, I will point out the fact he can be routed prior to losing 50% of his hit points. It's just very hard to do. Um, got a lot of lead. But once he gets below 50% hit points, he will literally fight to the death. That goes off his other ability here, which was he starts with when he's low health, he gets a boost to attack and leadership. Makes him even stronger there. Then he gets Mighty Opponent, which makes him actually be able to kill things. Prior to this, he's much more defensive, causes terror, and then finally, the Great White Lizard. He gets a massive boost to his battle healing cap, which is absolutely nuts, and he regenerates. Basically, throw him against trash units, he will never die fighting them, and he will regenerate his way out of almost anything. His weakness is um, dueling lords, lords that can get close to him and hit him hard before his regeneration heals. If that's the case, if he takes the damage, get him out of there. He'll heal up. You can send him in again. Uh, th that's his big leak. He gets Honored Elder, which you want to snag. Cheaper Soros, cheaper Temple Guards, and a Ward Save. He can be even harder to kill. He's also one of the few Lords where getting these resistances uh, can be very powerful early on. Just already has good resistances. And um, overall, he's a very defensive. His quests are nice. Again, more melee defense, and an augment that boosts his melee attack. Field of Eons, defense in an area, expert charge defense, and a massive boost in armor when used. A very strong boost to Soros, gives him fire resistance and more armor. This guy gets all the resistances, basically, and all the armor. Now, not all the best, but it makes a big difference on an already powerful fighter. Now, we might be noticing the floating mummy, and this is a mummified body. This is Lord Croak, which you will see references to elsewhere in the campaign on Lizardmen. Lord's Croak is a legendary man. He's a legendary hero unit, so he will never stay dead. He's unique in that he can provide two different bonuses to the army. He can train them to replenish troops. He also will boost income and stimulate growth. Quite interesting. 
he starts with all these amazing unique stuff. He hexes enemies in the area, he heals the armies, he causes terror, he recruits, he has magic resistance, he gives ward save to the accompanying lord, he gives weapon strength, he gives spell resistance to the hero army. If you already thought Gorok had all the resistance, wait till you add a lord's broke and it gets worse. Now, when you add him to an army, you get a choice, punishment or training. Almost always you want the replenishment. 8% of replenishment from the start of the game is Now, if we look at Lord Croak, Lord Croak has a unique tree for skills. First off, he can get his replenishment of troops even higher. Be pretty nuts. Starts at 3, you can add 9 to it. 12, worth doing. He has some very unique stuff. First off, Supreme Shield of the Old Ones used periodically to protect allies in range from damage. Get it so it has a very low cooldown, 30 seconds. Very nice. Again, he also gets greater ward, which gives ward saves to the army. He gets eternal guardians, which gives increased leadership for spawning research rate. Irrepressible, he heals basically in one or two turns. Missile resistance protection. Again, lots of the resistance starts with insane missile and spell resistance. So getting something like telekinesis. Pushes that to 75% and 80% spell resistance. The only thing that's going to kill this guy is melee combat, so keep him out of it. Now, he has a reserve. This is similar to Matt's ability. Uh, he's always going to have some magic. Also, enemies going to get less magic around him, and his <coughs> winds of magic will replenish faster. He gets a barrier, similar to Matt's ability, terror, control gets regeneration, making him hard to kill, and higher state of consciousness, exactly like Matsumunde, his barrier can be back. Now, what makes this guy nuts? It's these things, the deliverance of Itzas. These are a series of spells that get stronger, and they, they are slightly different if you cast them. Uh, they cost Winds of Magic, but they are some of the strongest spells in the game. Honestly, they're probably my favorite ones. They're simple, they hit a large area, they do lots of damage, they do magic and armor piercing damage. You cast several of these on an enemy army and they will just die. Um, and he then, when he is casting, he can give all these bonuses to the entire map, ward save, damage resistance. He should be able to cast quite a few spells in battle and making the army he's fighting look He's just a great unit. Now, we have some unique rights here. You'll notice that we're missing the central two have changed. First off, you can get recruitment and army experience and battle loot. Nice. But the big one is right of resilience. Gives barriers to your Soros and Temple Guard units that the enemies have to hack through and not let regenerate before they die. Immune to contact effects is very nice when you're fighting Skaven. And expert charge defense makes your... LA non speared infantry unit suddenly counter spearmen, uh, or suddenly counter cav without being spearmen. So you can just build Soros warriors instead of Soros spearmen, and you will be fine as long as you use it right. Last five turns has a very short cooldown, it is fairly cheap. You're going to be want to use this a lot. It's very good on the defense. This guy is the defensive lord. You stick him in Itza with a full army, which Itza can support, and Old line, and it's an almost untakeable settlement. In him and Lord Croak, you can hold out against everything. And that's good because you're probably going to be fighting on a couple different fronts. So to start, you can win this battle and you can take this settlement, but you will lose units. So win the battle, retreat, recruit some units. Soros warriors, probably. You don't need the spear ones. Fighting Skaven. Go in, take that province, build up again, march over here, take Quetzal, get your first province. And you've got some other questions about where you want to go. There are Skaven to your south here that you can go after. You can go north because there's a Corn faction and a Zeech faction up here that you might want to keep. There's a couple Lizardmen scattered around. It's worth being friends with them if you can. You can confederate them and trade with them later. Um, this one's interesting because this is actually a magical elf forest that the Lizardmen own. And fairly well but this wood elves still want it back uh then as you go up here obviously you're going to run across the problem the vampire coast uh britonia 
and the Huntsman General up there. So look forward to dealing with that nonsense. Uh, overall, though, it's actually not a bad start. If you make friends with the dwarfs, the other lizardmen, um, you can pretty much not have to fight half the continent, continent and march through their lands to go fight other people. I really like this start. If anything, this guy is too strong. So have fun with him. Um, this guy is probably the easiest to get a good geomantic web going. You've got friends and neighbors that you don't have to conquer. And that is Borok the White Lizard, Ender of Itza, the insanely powerful. Oh, before I forget, he gets barriers for all his units when he's defending, which makes his garrisons nuts, and he gets defensive supplies. Trying to take these guys' settlement are a pain, and it's amazing to defend as this guy. Enjoy. Okay, everybody, well, well, welcome, welcome to Antarctica. Cough, cough, chaos waits, Mark II, cough, cough, random world reflection province. We are playing with a very unique Lizard Lord down here that we're going to cover. This is Oxel Yotel. Probably saying it wrong. This is the newest of the Lizard Man Lords and one of the strangest ones. This guy plays very unlike all the other Lizard Man factions. Got an entirely different focus of his campaign. So first off, you start down here in the Godless Crater in a very unique starting. You're also one of the few good factions that can tolerate Chaos Wasteland with no penalty. Has to do with the guy's lore, he basically fights chaos wherever he can find it. If you want to move your oracle in here, fight this battle, which you can win. It's against a corn faction. Then you want to retreat back into your lands and build up. You can't take the settlement unless you're going to micro command it on the battlefield, which you can definitely win because you start with two dinosaur units. But it's not really worth the effort because you're fighting corn. Godless Crater here has. Salt, it's not worth building. You're much better off getting either Soros, Flying, or um, even a public order building. You're not going to be in your lands a lot of the game, so making sure your lands don't die to various garrisons and other stuff is totally a the, the plan as this guy. So, first off, he has cheaper skink. Yes, he's another skink lord. On the other hand, his skink are probably the best skink. Um, although the Cult of Sotex guy, who's literally located right here, and you'll want to be friends with, is another option. Every time they level up, they get plus one melee attack, defense, and leadership. So a level nine skink has nine attack and defense more. Makes them much more viable on the battlefield, and they move faster as well. Move faster, hit harder at range. This guy is an ambusher, who your main unit is going to be lots of chameleon, and Chameleon Stalker Skink units, backed up by dinosaurs, probably, or maybe a couple Soros. So, let's look at the Lord, then we'll go into his unique mechanics. So, first, he who hunts unseen, he does not have a diplomatic penalty if this army, not any other ones, wanders through enemy lands. He has Masterful Ambush, which is weak stance, or has less movement range, and is reduced detection, making him very good at ambushes, uh, you basically want to stay in that stance all the time in enemy territory. He has armor-piercing damage for his skinks, which solve their problem of not being able to take on armored units. And when fighting forces of chaos, his units get more experience. And skink units get leveled up, get the bonuses faster. Now, standard blue line, you want to get Gifts of the Jungle rather quickly. Renowned and feared, obviously, all good stuff. What comes and is very interesting is, first off, he's got a skink line here of yellow can be worth it because he is a ranged uh lizard men lord uh dead eye and some of these other ones piercing shots make him very good at sniping enemy lords or monster units which is what you should use him for he's not a melee lord despite the fact that you can boost his melee defense long range sniping he's got a decent range ancient knowledge he gets a sanctum gem per turn this is We'll explain it later. This is a great one to take. Research, experience gain, bonus when fighting chaos factions and reduce corruption. You're going to be fighting a lot of chaos and other corruptive factions, so it's great. Hidden nuisance makes him even better at ambushing people, and all his skink units get stalk, snipe. Snipe is great on chameleon skinks. I said you would use them. They're your green ranged skirmisher unit. They can now fire while hidden, which makes killing them a 
pain. They can just keep running away while invisible shooting and you can't return range fire or rather the enemy can't return range fire. Floor of Lost Worlds, cheaper upkeep for um, some odd selection of units. Um, quite nice. You can get more oracles and boosts. If you're going to use this, take it. Other, if you're going to use those units, take it. Otherwise, don't. Behind enemy lines, it's amazing. You get casualty replenishment in foreign territory, meaning you can stay in ambush stance and still heal. You get additional attack and melee damage in uh, range damage and melee attack and lands, and you get global recruitment. This guy is going to be using a fair amount of global recruitment, especially if things start to go wrong with him. And then long revenge, all his skink get additional ammunition, bigger loss reduction. You move further, and he is perfect bigger, meaning he can run away and snipe ever. He can talk, and he can move. He is an amazing ambusher as well. Um, he can ambush. He can boost. Things in an area where you can shoot from a longer range, snipe and unspottable, so he's not seen while attacking. Uh, he's kind of like Alethanar in terms of being an annoying range unit. And uh, that's his big bonuses there. So up top is the last stuff. This They don't tell you what the descriptions do, but basically what this does is it gets you a kind of a banner. It's it's not actually a banner, but think of it like a banner ancillary. You can then add it to a unit, and this one will allow them to have different types of attack, like magic, poison. You get a couple of them. If you put them on really high-level chameleon skirmishers, um, it makes them very powerful. All right, chameleon skinks. They're basically upgraded skirmishers. This is the unit you're going to be using a lot of. However... You do need a line of melee troops to tie up the enemy, and that's where you're going to either use dinosaurs or a handful of Soros or Temple Guards to tie down some of the enemy while you flank and shoot them from range. If you fight the battles, obviously if you auto-resolve, it's different. Now, this is where things get interesting. First off, standard rights, right of Sotek, because you're using uh, alien stalkers and skinks, very powerful, and the attrition is very nice as well. Plus the increased ambush, you'll basically have a hundred plus ambush. Units. It's amazing. This up here is his silent sanctums. These are basically hidden outposts that you can scatter around anywhere on the map and you use sanctum gens to get them. Every eight, you get one. Now you get them from either battles or missions, or you get them passively if you unlock uh, ancient knowledge. You're going to want to stick these everywhere that you can, um, specifically in enemy lands, your lands, or allies' lands. It will help keep your allies alive, help you. There's a vast variety of uses. So once you get them, you can you see this pulsing yellow. This says that there is a sanctum here. When you have eight gems, you click this, you can then pick them. But so the sanctum is kind of like a Skaven Undercity or a hidden uh, Vampire Coast port in your own lands. You can build three different buildings there. So you can build this one, which gives visibility over the local area, and then fully upgraded gives visibility over the nearby areas. Very nice if you want to know what people around you are doing or around the sanctum. It doesn't have to be your land. You can stick this in Nagaron from here, once you know where Nagaron is, and then see everything around it if you want to keep an eye on enemies. The next one is the green one, and this is the most complex. You can have decreased recruitment and global recruitment. So uh, this is not a bad one to stick in your home region uh, or wherever you're going to purchase units from. Cheaper recruitment is amazing, especially on the lizard land. Then you have increased replenishment. It can be very good if you're uh, running out, fighting, retreating to your lands for heal, uh, or if you have a defensive army defending this 30% replenishment let's be honest and it applies to local and adjacent regions and enemy territory so if i was to build it here and march in here my army would replenish as well it's really powerful then you've got reduced upkeep in this in nearby regions and increased battle loop i would be very careful with this one it's very powerful but remember that if you then move outside of those regions your upkeep costs can jump by 20 and on a fully upgraded army this top line, it can be like a couple thousand gold chains. Just be wary of it. 
Then you have a capstone. So this allows you to teleport around the map, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But it dedicates it, des designates the region as a location that your lord can teleport to. Only one can exist at a time. If you build a new one, you'll get rid of this one. Um, I believe you can always teleport back to your capital region. So you want to build this somewhere else. If you've got an ally faction you want to keep alive, sticking this in their capital would allow you to jump to help them, stuff like that. Or if you know you're going to be jumping to a regional. And then we have probably one of my favorite buildings in the game, the ambush patrols. So this, you're going to want to build this in your capital province to start. Every time an enemy unit moves in your land, there's a 25% that get ambushed by a, a small army of your units. And obviously, that's a 33% chance, and it's stronger. These armies are unlikely to kill a fully upgraded enemy army, but if they're invading your lands, they will probably trigger it once or twice marching through your lands. Um, by the time they get to your cities to attack them, their army has been weakened and beaten up. This allows you to probably be, I would say, the most defensive faction in the game. Now, this is this is an amazing tactic, and I'm going to tell you it right now. You can set this up in enemy provinces. You could put this in, say, Nagarond, and then every time Malekith leaves his tower there to go expand his empire, he gets ambushed and dies if he doesn't have a lot of units. If not, he takes damage. Uh, it can be a great source of money and stuff if you wipe out the army. And that army disappears after the battle, so don't worry about losing. The only thing you have to worry about is helping the enemy level up and giving them money. But it will take out small enemies and it will harass much larger armies. You want to put this in a lot of sanctums. Really, you do. Um, I tend to not put a ton of this visibility stuff unless uh, I need to know what's going on. Uh, probably if I have... Once I get eight gems in this, I would probably stick an ambush, another sanctum right here to control anything from the east. Like these guys would have to then fight their way through it um, if they want to invade my lands and take damage. This goes very well with putting garrisons in every settlement because then not only do they get ambushed, but then they have to deal with garrisons. Okay, now that we've covered all of that, and that was a lot, this guy is very different. Let's talk about his how he plays the game. So this guy is all about countering chaos. So he gets visions of the old ones. And it kind of describes them here, so I won't go into fully details about them. Basically, if you click on, say, your capital, or if you stick down a waypost, you will teleport. You can teleport there um, from around the map. These locations will appear scattered around the world, and there'll be a lot of them. You won't be able to handle all of them. But this one is have 20 turns if you kill this faction you'll get new visions now that changes but you also get gems and treasury and you tend to get either new visions blessed units or various other bonuses the consequences of failure start to change as you progress through the game uh, sometimes they will be if you don't destroy an army in time it will take over the nearby area there could be a revolt uh I'm trying to remember all of them. There's some that you can have, like, beastmen spawn. Uh, you can take damage. The settlement can even be destroyed in extreme cases. Chaos will get stronger. There can be cases where it will target enemy lords. Um, in Total Warhammer 2, uh, the guy, uh, the Skeggy lord, the Lustrian Norska guy, tended to get it a lot. And it would be kill him. If you don't kill him, he will get a boost to his melee and combat strength for the rest of the game. So you have to pick and choose which visions you want to deal with and which ones will have the worst consequences for you. Some will have horrible consequences for your lands, others will not. Overall, the goal is to keep completing these missions and his victory one is uh, he has to complete 25 visions of the old ones, either normal or hard for the short, and then it expands further on to areas. Oh, for a short victory, you just want to complete the missions, and there'll be other events as well. Um, it's very fun because you build up an army, subdue a home region, put some defenses there, and then you start teleporting all over the map, fighting chaos. Like, you will end up in the Empire, you will end up in Norsky, you will end up in the High Elves, you'll end up in Bay, all over the world, fighting monsters. 
and you just got to pick and choose which ones you want. The way he plays is different, though, because only his army can teleport. You want to make his army as strong as Lizard Man and Lee possible. And then maybe have a small defensive army with the Sanctum and a garrison to defend his home region. You don't necessarily need to expand that much. It's not a bad move in my campaign experience to try and subdue the most of this continent you can. It's a huge continent, though, so you probably won't get it all. But once you do, you're probably never going to have to deal with enemies really again. I find the enemies don't tend to invade from the north downwards. Also, none of these guys want the Chaos Wasteland, which um, in fact, as this guy, uh, I don't know if it says it, but basically every single, um, every single climate he can live in happily, including like deserts, magical forests, he can live in all of them. Really quite cool. And that's what he looks like. This guy's very fun, a very different lizard band campaign. Uh, it does require a DLC for Total Warhammer 2, but it is a very fun lord to play. On to the last and most unique lord. Okay, here we are. Last lord, Nakai the Wanderer. Do you like roguelikes? Do you like games where, despite how strong you get, there's always a feeling of problem? Do you like Dark Souls or Elden Rings? If so, this might be the lord for you. Hi. Um, just messing around a little bit. So Nakai the Wanderer is the last and definitely the most unique of the wizard lords. So Nakai is a very very powerful. Okay, here we are as the last Lord of the Lizardmen. If do you like roguelikes? Do you like hard campaigns where it never gets easier? Do you like Elden Ring and Dark Souls? If so, this might be the faction for you. Hey you guys. Uh, this is the last Lord, Nakai the Wanderer. Now, Nakai is a very unique Lizard Lord in the sense that he does not own settlement. He is a horde. He wanders around. This settlement here, which you can take first turn, as soon as you take it, it gets given to a subject of yours called the Defenders of the Great Plan. Uh, this guy, this faction will pay you money, might have a small army, will not go on offensive, is pretty much purely defensive. Thankfully, they get a very strong defensive garrison. That means taking these settlements takes a very powerful enemy to that, so they tend not to lose their lands. Now, when you give them it, you can select between different allegiances. Itzel, Itzel, or whatever that is. These come with different benefits. As you level them up, for example, once you get to level 5 temples, you get missile resistance for a lot of your troops and all your armies. Plus, you'll have the ability to pay this unique resource, which is Old One's Favor, you get from having vassals, establishing temples, and um, then you could spend it on recruiting a Sar Sora Scar veteran. It will unlock it so that you can recruit it, and then further up you can get the Blessed Spawning. This one. And then finally at the top you can activate this uh, benefits given to the Defenders of the Great Plan and can do stuff. So as you can see, fully upgraded into one dedication. Powerful. This is the Soros Croxigo Temple Guard one. This one over here is about beasts and again all about beasts and getting more of them this one over here is the magic one nakai is not a spellcaster so i don't tend to use magic on him as long, as much as i should wizard men have some pretty powerful magic users you can still get slam magic priests um and king priests and stuff so it can be pretty powerful in the end and the benefits are lots of magic better relations with Lizard men, and you get a storm ability, which you can use twice, which hits enemies in an area. So you get a free spell at the end. I tend to focus on this one. That's my opinion. Quetzal. Quetzal isn't bad. This one over here, only if you're going to use magic. Now, Nakai himself is a, has a horde. So you have a horde building that you build up over time. Increased growth rate, upkeep, movement range, gives you some money. Very powerful. Uh, the growth building here is your horde. You have to get growth. It's different than settlements. Once you do, you have to pay horde growth to build most buildings and to upgrade, obviously. Um, for example, this costs one. It's similar to the wood elves mechanic. Um, you can get 
every single unit you can get in a normal um uh, I believe you can get every single unit you can get as a normal wizard room faction. There might be one or two missing, though I haven't really noticed. You've got basically everything that matters. Croxagor, Temple Guards. Um he doesn't get normal Croxagors though, he gets sacred ones just from the beginning. Um because he doesn't have the building that would unlock sacred, they just give it to you from the start. Uh, he's going to use a lot of Croxagors. They're really powerful. Croxagors, Temple Guards, and Dinosaurs. Similar to everything else you've seen. So let's talk about his support buildings, which are unique for him. He has a training hall that has a casualty replenishment rate and horde growth rate. This is good. If you've watched any of my other guides or even the other Elizabethan, you know I'm a big fan of casualty replenishment rate. This boosts it higher and is very useful. Then over here, you've got recruitment cost. Yeah, it's not great. It's a very low recruitment cost bonus, but considering you don't have a lot of income, it can help you get longer one. And by the way, you're going to be able to get nine buildings. So you can get three here, four here, so that's seven. That frees you up to get three of these, assuming you want all of them. If you had to miss one, I'd say miss the stable, which would free you up to get four of these five. Um, if you were to miss one, I would probably miss this recruit one and get the other four. They're better. This one, decreased upkeep. Since your army is, your horde is your base, is your whole faction, um, you're, this is basically just a permanent upkeep to your entire military. Um, it's great. Over here, army capacity. This is something you want to build pretty early on because if you lose Nakai's army, as in it's destroyed, the game is over. So having the ability to raise a second army over here, which you can't at start. So this might be a building to build instantly. Not that Nakai is in danger of dying instantly. As long as you have an army on the map, you're not dead. So what you can do is raise another Lord, run him over or sit him right next to your ally's base, put him in like ambush or a defensive stance. Therefore, if Nakai's army dies, uh, you can then rebuild Nakai the other army and then recruit it re-recruit nakai and build up his army and try again if you don't you're in the whole dark souls roguelike mode where it you're playing with fire if you lose a single battle the campaign could be over and there are people who are crazy enough to do one army nakai runs it's amazing to watch it's very hard so nakai himself first off he starts with the skink priest add it to the army take tower of ashon Nakai himself is a very powerful warrior. He starts off with some of the best stats in the game. Um, even starts with an activatable ability, which reduces the damage he takes and makes his melee defense super strong. Primal ability gives him physical resistance and melee attack to all his allies, meaning he suddenly jumps to 100 attack and his melee defense can go up to like 80 for a while. This is very powerful if you manually fight the battles you want to use it be aware that it does put on rampage meaning the unit will go crazy and ignore your orders so activate it when you're already in the middle of a fight your army has met the enemy and they're in melee use this and they will just annihilate crazy his personal abilities he has for spawn croxagors and sacred croxagor units are cheaper recruit and have better defenses as i said you get sacred rather than full ones at the high level using at your standard blue line this is especially important when your army is your settlement get 17 reduced maintenance there plus 10 from a building so 27 to support a larger army replenishment is a necessity since the army you lose your city when you re-recruit nakai if, if he's defeated you won't get all your buildings and horde stuff back which is annoying. unless they've changed that but i doubt they have um proud warrior if you're using Croxagors, it's a big boost to them. It's worth grabbing, especially of one major army, and you're not going to be able to support a second major army for some time. Your income sucks. Standard yellow line, this is even more important on him um, because at the highest levels, having a lord that just never dies and kills everything is always a good thing. Kind of like Grom Brindle in that sense. Then finally at the top, Legendary Warrior increases leadership a leadership aura and leadership effects stacks nicely with inspiring presence, meaning your units barely ever would route from a battlefield. Great. 
This increases your combat charge. This one gives discourage. So when you attack an enemy, they lose leadership. This is particularly powerful against demons and undead because they crumble once they get to low leadership, which is quite fun. Plus it adds terror. First spawning gives frenzy to all your Croxagor units, which just makes them hit harder until they lose half their health. They might not even lose half their health. Pretty nuts. Adornment, increased casualty and growth rate. Again, great for the recruitment because this is a faction where sitting around for a while, several turns waiting become problematic. And Sacred Wanderer makes Nakai himself unbreakable. He will slaughter lots of stuff. And again, attacking on Legendary Warrior Inspiring Presence. Obedience brings victory. Again, more leadership. Your units should never run from the battlefield unless they're terrified. The points and resistance. Got a few quests. He's got Ward Save, Golden Tributes, and Passive Ability, Golden Tributes. Last Forever gives damage resistance, area, and perfect figure for all your allies. This is great. He charges at the head of an army of Croxagors that never tire, that resist tons of damage, and they never die. The Ogdom Shard is pretty cool. Increased casualty replenishment, and it gives him a very needed spell resistance so that he can't just get nuked by a spell from a distance. He starts in a very unique starting location. No one else is quite near him. He starts in southeastern Cathay. Um, interestingly enough, there's a Wood Elf Settlement here, Magical Forest. That's not a Wood Elf Settlement. I think it will change. Uh, nearby is Cathay. Cathay tends to get along with you fairly well. Um, it's very possible to get non-aggression packs with them. Um, military access is not a real problem from Nakai. You can just pretty much wander everywhere. But at first, you take this settlement, you go over here, and you're fighting Norska that for some reason are in Cathay. Take them out, start migrating north. Your starting missions, the victory, is you have to kill off the Dark Elves up north, Vampire Coast there, and then the Vampires, which are located over here. If you want the short victory, that's where the game wants you to go. You want to head up this coast, take the land, give it to your subjects. They will not have any trouble holding on to the lands at all. The only problem is if they get invaded by a huge army, which shouldn't be an issue. Now, he's got unique rights because he does not fully function as a normal lizardman. He has right of mastery, which means his Croxigors are powerful. If you're going to recruit them or you need a big battle, activate this. They will become more armored, hit harder. And if you're recruiting, two ranks higher is pretty powerful. Then he has right of allegiance, which does not use money. These use favor of the old ones, these two, which is great. So if your defenders are being invaded, if you activate this, it will cause attrition to enemy armies, meaning they're less likely to take your defenders' lands. Right of Rebirth is quite cool because it will actually give the defenders of a great clan an army that won't replenish. So it will literally charge into the enemy and then die. But it does give them a military offensively, which is quite nice. They tend to be really ineffective and be very well aware that if they're invading any land with attrition, so vampires, demons of chaos, etc., they will take the attrition from marching through the corruption and they cannot heal it. So they get weaker very quickly. Don't use it in an area where they're going to walk into corruption. Thankfully, in the starting area you are, there's almost no corruption at the moment. Plus you purge corruption, just be aware Against the vampires up here, they prove to be less than effective. Um, and that's kind of it for Nakai. He does have a unique tech tree, so we'll quickly go over that. So first off, you can either build the unique horde building I mentioned earlier that gives army capacity, or you research this, which will give you army capacity and recruitment. This continues the theme up here. Relations, recruitment, capacity, etc probably never use all of your army capacity even late game beneath that are bonuses to fighting construction movement these middle ones make you immune to corruption and your heroes become immortal rather than dying which is great for a horde faction uh, and then over here bonuses with lizardmen strength of the great plan reduces casualties attrition, army strength and then finally basically means your global recruitment duration is nothing this means if you build up Nakai's horde to high and you have other smaller hordes wandering around, which you can get, and I do recommend, this will allow them to recruit straight from Nakai's. Now, it's still expensive to recruit from Nakai's army. 
the global cost is still high, but they will train almost instantly. Okay, so the bottom line here is the growth. So the big thing you'll notice is it gives tribute from vassals. You want to build this up. This is your only real source of income outside of raising settlements, looting them, or giving battles. Plus, it gives casualty replenishment as well. So it's very useful. Now, it does cost um, Old One's Favor, which is a very precious resource that you will mainly get from your vassal. Again, incentivizing you to build your vassal large, then you get more money and more gifts from them. Up here is your bonuses. This boosts your skinks, your beasts, your soros, your stegodons, and then finally your croxagors. You want to get to the croxagor one ideally. The rest of this is less than useful, but you might be using some soros. I recommend avoiding the skink in general, and bonuses to the old ones and pterodons is a useless tech, but you need it to unlock a better one. Then you get metamorphosis, means your croxagors replenish faster and less vulnerable to missiles. And then terror is unbelievably good on croxagors, meaning if you can rout the enemy, even though their leadership is high, they will then slaughter them before they can recover. Over here, if you want to have better skinks, better soros, Better mounts, better beasts, all prime of terrible, but then if you get increased, recruit, increased recruitment for Croxagors. This is probably the last section of the tree I would focus on for a while. Um, I might even take this area of the subtree before I take this one, but it's up to you. Just be aware that you not you don't get maximum amounts of old one's favor. So pick where you want to go. I do recommend getting an army out on the field, a second one pretty early on in case somehow Nakai gets ambushed and died. Unless you're playing like hardcore Iron Man with one save type thing, you're going to want to make backup saves periodically as this guy because losing Nakai's horde, unless you've got a backup plan, is devastating. Um, plus the game just ends. There's no chance to reload an old save if you only have one army. It just ends. Um, in which case you have to reload from an older save. So. Best of luck with Nakai. I recommend boosting Quetzal if you're going to do melee. This one if you're going to use uh, units. That one for magic. Get a horde of vassals paying you tribute and hope they give you enough money because right now vassals don't give a lot of cash. Enjoy. Sorry for taking almost two hours. If you've watched this entire guide in its entirety, you are an amazing person. Clearly had some free time or really wanted to learn how to play the lizard. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it helps you been a very in-depth dive. I've learned some stuff as well in prepping for this. Uh, the Lizardmen are a very fun faction. If you have watched this far, please do like and subscribe. I do greatly appreciate it. And leave a comment. I answer most comments at all. And check out my other guides. And I hope to see you guys all in another guide or even a Let's Play or a stream someday. Bye for now.